Today we have a malicious compliance story about a prisoner of war. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, leave the floor wet? Alright, enjoy your rotten wood. Back in the early 2000s, my mother, 40-year-old female, worked as a cleaner for a couple places and took me, 13-year-old male, with her to help. One place we worked for was the only real estate place in town. We cleaned up before the people who worked there got in. When I started there, it was small and somewhat dirty. Old, smelly cubicle partitions and faded brown, off-color walls, ingrained dirt in the linoleum. We cleaned and I literally couldn't tell the difference after we were done, except the mirror in the washroom not having any spots on it and the floor being wet from the fresh mopping. Then the town started becoming a cottage town and it's decided that they'll move to a nicer place. Cottagers might find the griminess a little off-putting. New place had a bit more space, brand new blue cubicle partitions, newly painted walls that still smelled the first day I cleaned in there, and a cheap hardwood panel floor. That floor was a bit of a problem. See, before, when we mopped, we would just leave the water to dry on the linoleum. We could do that because we got there around 6.30 and they opened at 7.30. The place was small enough that it was mopped by around 7 o'clock before we left and would be mostly dry by the time people arrived. If we did the same thing for this cheap wood floor, my mother was worried we would have water seep into the cracks between the wood panels and rot them. So a new method for mopping was devised. First I dunked the mop, then ring the mop lightly, mop up, ring the mop again but fully this time, and then mop up as much of the excess water as possible. This new method actually visibly got a lot more water off the floor. By the time we left, some of the earlier mopped areas would look mostly dry. Good solution, mom. Couple weeks into the new place, my mother gets contacted by the manager and a new order comes in that we are not to dry the floor. I asked if she explained why we dried it. She had. I found this order a bit baffling at the time, and it only occurred to me today the reason why he ordered this. The manager got in earlier than everyone else at around 7.15, so I actually saw him a few rare times when we ran late. The old floor would have still been visibly wet in the old place when he got in. The new floor was now dry when he got in. Ipso facto, we must have decided to skip mopping to leave early. Even though I didn't understand at the time that he thought we weren't doing our job, I of course found this new order stupid. I thought, he wants the floors wet when he gets in? Fine. Cue malicious compliance. You see, I did the mopping while my mom cleaned the washroom because I was a young strapping lad and she was mom, so I did what she said. I now had a standing order from the boss to leave a wet floor and by gum it was gonna be sopping. From that day forth, not only did I not dry the floor, I now didn't even wring the mop after dunking it. I dipped it in the water and just let water slop off the mop as I pulled it directly out of the bucket. There was no way this was gonna dry before he got in. Probably not for an hour after he got in either. Two weeks after I started doing this, lo and behold, the wood paneling is already starting to separate at the seams. Dirt is accumulating between tiles. It proves impossible to remove. I was a bit shocked at the time at how fast that had happened. Four weeks into the new mopping routine, the floor was rotting. Was my mother psychic or what? It was apparently very cheap fiberboard with a paper thin plastic wood grain pattern on it. I would have guessed a laminate wood grain on top of a semi waterproof fiberboard if you'd asked me four weeks ago. The floor now had visible divots and lines where the plastic paper sank into the deteriorating wood underneath. These trapped in dirt in them as well. How classy. The floor, not even two months after they'd moved into the new place, was worse than the old beat up linoleum one. At this point I asked my mother if we should start drying the floor, and wouldn't you know it, she'd already asked. The answer was no, leave it wet, baffling. We cleaned there for another month or so. I barely felt safe walking on the floor as it was now a tripping hazard with warped parts popping up. It was also disintegrating. Splinters of wood would pop off every time I swept. The floor now had the dubious distinction of being the worst floor I had seen in a place that wasn't dilapidated. The manager and anybody else that works in this place has an impressive level of not giving a crap at all about your workspace. Were the customers not complaining? Did the manager not have eyes? 
I don't understand how you can tell them, I am telling you exactly why your floors are literally falling apart, only to be met with, no, nah, keep doing it. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, your trash cans may only be out at specific times. We live in an HOA, and if you don't, lucky you. We've never really had any real problems. They don't do much other than make sure the park and gardens look good. Anyhow, for whatever reason, they decided to add a new rule. It wasn't needed, but I guess they got bored and wanted something to do. Maybe someone kept leaving their trash cans out all week. Fine, just ask them not to, it's not that hard. The new rule states when trash cans can be put out. They can't be out before 6am on Wednesdays and must be put back before 6pm the same day. This is obviously stupid and has a few problems. First of all, some people use a different company. The HOA provided one goes on Wednesday and it's cheap so most people use it, but you don't have to. Some people have theirs go Monday or Tuesday. Also, a lot of people here work in the medical field and just aren't home during those times, so no one's there to put out or bring in cans. So a few of us got together on how to comply but be annoying about it. We decided to comply with their set times as best as we can, take it out at 6 when a lot of us go to work or go for a morning walk, and take it back in at 6 since most of us are home. Some of us help by taking others bins to the street if they're at work. But when it's time to take out the trash, do it as loud as freaking possible. Bin has wheels? Drag it. Got it to the street? Make sure it's firmly placed on the street. Need to take out another bag? Slap it in there and let the lid slam shut. For those who have trash that goes out on other days, comply with the times, but do it on your trash day. Then also put them out on Wednesday as required. If you can, leave trash in them and leave the lid open so it would bake in the sun all day. Yes, it did smell like hot trash, that's the point. After three weeks of this, an email was sent out. The rule was thrown out and we were all simply asked to put out and take in our cans within a reasonable amount of time, preferably on trash day. Was it really that freaking hard to ask nicely? Why not just address whoever was the problem? Know that, because an HOA rule was changed, a lawyer was paid to look over it before the CC&R could be updated. That means this stupid rule cost every resident money. Anyhow, we're already planning on voting out one member of the board who we know is the problem come the summer election. Ah, just another lovely month in suburbia. Funny enough, where I live, I have similar-ish rules, but I don't think I've ever seen or heard of anybody having any kind of enforcement. You come home after work, it's 8pm, 9pm or whatever, you work late. Is anybody going to complain about seeing some trash cans, empty trash cans at the side of the road still a couple hours after you're supposed to put them away? There was definitely one jerk who left his cans out all week and the HOA comes along and sees it like, I'll solve this problem. Our next story is, manager tried throwing me under the bus, so I showed everyone her incompetence. I recently resigned from a toxic workplace as a data analyst at a startup. It was promising at the start, but not long after, I noticed many red flags, including the fact that my manager had absolutely no data analysis or management experience prior to being promoted. How can you manage analysts without knowing basic Excel functions? I ignored those red flags and trusted her leadership because I liked the company's goals. Little did I know this would be the worst decision ever. I basically did all the work for the team for the whole year I was there. When I ran the numbers for reporting and analysis of team performance, she always asked me to dumb it down so she can present it to high level management. I thought everything was going well because I only got good feedback from her and the rest of the team. About a month ago, a coworker who I didn't get along with made a complaint about me which was absolutely untrue. Manager believed it without investigating and all of a sudden I was placed on a PIP. She spouted all types of lies to HR and when I refuted those claims with written evidence, they doubled down and started gaslighting me. You're just too negative. I refused to sign and was threatened with termination, so I complied and started building a case against them. I knew she was doing the PIP to terminate me as she looked for internal candidates to replace me in secret. 
because she was dumb enough to set the meeting up beside me. Once I signed my contract for a new job, I did basically freak all and started working from home. Before my resignation, she asked me to do some reporting for her, so I ran the numbers and sent her the raw data, told her where the files were located, and that she can analyze the data and make the presentation herself. Since she's the data analyst manager, she should know how to do it. She tried reporting me for that, but it ultimately backfired because they asked her if the work that I did was actually wrong and was forced to admit that she didn't know what she was looking at. Everything else in the team was questioned, and I believe they're now being audited by an external investigator. Credibility destroyed. I'm now working for a manager who's competent and has clear goals for the team, but that was a heck of a ride. Small win against toxic management, but a win is a win. PIP is a performance improvement plan by the way, apparently it's used by managers to address underperformance and start a documentation process. They're basically saying you're underperforming and I guess they could probably kind of abuse it to put this label on somebody so they can have a reason for firing them. Our next story is, you can't progress without a degree. Back in 2019, I was working as a property manager for a nationwide estate agency, real estate, managing a portfolio of a thousand rental properties. I was earning 18,000 British pounds, 22,000 USD, a year for 40 hour work week. Our lowest rent on a property was 900 pounds, the most was around 2,500 pounds, so the branch was bringing in over 900,000 pounds per month. The company took anywhere between 10% and 20% depending on the landlord's package, which means at absolute minimum the branch was making 90,000 pounds a month. I worked hard, often did overtime, unpaid, and made sure the tenants had everything they needed. I asked for a pay raise, as on my income, I didn't even pass reference checks for our cheapest properties. I was told I was on the top pay level for my job role, I asked about a potential promotion, and was told that there was absolutely no chance of advancement within the company without a degree. That weekend, at 29 years old, I called a university clearing line and registered for a bachelor's in photography. I went into the office on Monday handed in my resignation, and pointed out the reason I was leaving was to get a degree so I could further my career. My manager managed to make a substantial pay rise magically appear, but I rejected it. I'm now 32 and doing a master's degree, and funnily enough, under a lot less pressure than I was back then. If you've got a superstar worker, and they start complaining about, oh, I want a raise, or is there a potential promotion? You definitely see what you can do to give them at least a little something to make them happy? I mean, you don't want to look like a fool like this manager did where they say, here's my resignation, and all of a sudden they go, here's a raise that you wanted all along. Why even let it get to that point? This next story is Compliant POW. My grandfather, born around 1924, died some 20 years ago, but I recently got the letters he wrote as a prisoner of war to his family in 1944 to 46. I'm creating digital copies of the letters, and while most are very heavy, sad, and personal, I came across two letters written in a brighter mood with some malicious compliance. He was a prisoner of the US forces, and prisoners of war had to work, mostly helping with construction of barracks, rebuilding infrastructure and such. Of course, they complied, and did what they were told to do, but only what they were told, nothing more nothing less. Letter number one, one day they had to carry construction lumber from A to B, and each one grabbed a single piece of lumber and went on their way. An American guard thought that wasn't enough, and wanted them to carry at least two at once. But with the language barrier, the order given was a blend of German and English, hey, nim, tu and das. So they did comply. Two prisoners would carry a single lumber, and they refused to understand any other meaning. The letter doesn't state the immediate fallout and it seems that he enjoyed this little act of resistance. A few days later, letter number two mentions some kind of malicious justice from the guards. A local bakery is finally restored and the camp received a load of fresh baked farmers rolls, rolls made from dark bread dough. Everyone got a ladle of soup and two rolls, except when my grandfather and his friends were up, one guard said with probably the biggest grin, no, nim tu and das. 
The joke was not lost on my grandfather, but he was utterly destroyed to miss out on these freshly baked rolls as food was scarce and often there was only water soup with old bread edges. It's definitely sad to hear that even in the American side of POW life, I mean you're still only getting like water soup with bread edges a lot of the time. It took a lot of fortitude to survive and thrive in those kinds of circumstances for sure, lest we not even need to mention some of the circumstances in some of the other countries that were very famously happening at the same time. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another crazy malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.